I remember watching you when I was younger and I'm going to fangirl for a second, FYI. <laughs> oh, I'm going to fangirl too. So I'm just um, so in awe of what you're doing. Like, I think, um, you know, when I first heard about you, it would have been like a couple of years ago, I reckon. Um, and then just watching like the work that you're doing, it's just remarkable. And um, yeah, I, it's a real shame we don't have you here doing this stuff here locally so we'll talk about all yeah. that stuff anyway oh, we will. We definitely yeah. will. for the theme for this month it is actually about being the only woman in the room um so you know obviously we want to talk to other people about their experiences of being um the only woman in the room and you've literally been operating um and head coaching uh, a men's team over in africa for a long time now like what what is that like and and how did it happen and tell me everything like how did you get over there this is amazing to me well um, my twin sister and i originally volunteered in zambia in 2008 in a not-for-profit um, coaching organization and so we just volunteered in zambia for one month and fell in love with the country and then we kept visiting and then i decided Let's go to a basketball opening tournament. So the men's Super League were in their preseason tournament and I decided to go along and just watch because as a female coach, you were, we're taught from a very early age that at the end of the day, we're gonna coach juniors, predominantly girls, and then we're gonna go and coach women. And so in my mind, the thought of coaching men had never even crossed it. Right. And I'm just sitting there watching these men's teams play and I'm like, I think I could coach in this league. Um, and I ended up approaching one of the clubs and said, can I come in and run a training session just to, as a guest coach? And I was really lucky because the president of the club had worked for the IMF and he was very open minded. And if anything, the ticket in was that I was Australian and we have a great global reputation. And so I was riding on that basically, because up until this point, I had never coached men. And so I ended up going to that first training session. It was only supposed to be an hour, ended up running the whole session. Why don't you come back? And then eventually I went on to head coach this club team and we won the national title that year. And so I've since gone on to head coach and assistant coach men's club teams and national teams throughout Africa for the last decade. That's incredible. So how, like, how did you personally get the confidence to make that call to go up to somebody and say, I want to run a session, like, let me do it. Like, how did you do that? I know, I often look back and go, I don't know what went through my mind, but I was like, what's the worst they can say? He can say no. And I, let's be honest, I was a little bit arrogant as well, riding on that Australian card. I was like, yeah. hey, this is Zambia. They've never competed internationally in basketball. We're the second best country in the world when it comes to basketball. And so I think I had that confidence. Plus, you know, I had studied sports science and sports management and had a coaching a degree, a master's degree in coaching. And I really felt I was qualified. I'd been coaching for eight years why wouldn't I just walk up to this person and say, let me run a training session? And so yeah. I think having all that behind me was really the reason why I felt confident enough to ask the question. Right. That's, you know, I think because that's such a big issue as well for women in sport is actually having that confidence to stand up and say, hey, give me a shot. Like, look at me. I'm here. I'm good enough to do this, you know? A hundred percent. So good for you. That's bloody awesome. Um, Look, you know, there's a question here just around like coaching um, in Africa as opposed to Australia, but like you've just said, it, you're coaching men over there for the first time. What, as a, as a coach or someone that's been in two different systems, like what, what are the differences that you've sort of experienced? Well, African basketball is a lot less organised than what we see in Australia. Um, we don't have players starting from under eights or even younger. Um, generally, athletes come to the sport around 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, so these players are, um, don't necessarily have the solid foundation skills, the fundamentals that we would see in Australia. And so as a coach, you've got to understand that you're not necessarily working with players who see the game the same way that we do in Australia. There's definitely a different style and a different level of skills. So for me, 
Um, it was learning how to adapt off quickly, accept the differences rather than come in and be like, well, this is how we do things in Australia. Yeah. Um, and so for me, um, I've learned to be a lot more relaxed in terms of I'm not out there teaching the flex offense or UCLA. I'm teaching concepts and decision making and letting players really dictate how they want to play. Um, obviously, I'm not coaching children. Um, I'm coaching yeah. adults. So. I rely on their experience, but at the national level, I'm working with players who have comp competed in the NBA, EuroLeague, play in Pro A, ACB. And so I'm learning as much as from them as they are from me. And so now when it comes to national teams, it's a lot more structured and you can run those sets and schemes. But at a local level, when you're dealing with clubs, it's definitely more free flowing, less structured and transition orientated. So I'm definitely better at coaching transition than playing in the half court and I think um, a lot of mistakes that foreign coaches make be that when they go to Africa or they're coaching in Europe or wherever is they want to stamp their way of doing things but what I have to say I learned the most by coaching in Africa is learning to adapt and be open to different styles and different standards. Yeah so I guess the next natural question and I apologize this isn't on the list I'm just listening to you talk but how how have you managed to um, get the guys to like trust you and in, in what you're doing as a as a coach and also that respect factor because you know like athletes are different you know and everyone responds differently but I, I feel like in a different culture as well there'd be really unique challenges and I guess for me as an ex-athlete how like it, it really does interest me how you've been able to really win these guys over. Well, I think first and foremost, I've always been very interested in um, history and culture. So it starts on that level, whether I'm coaching in Kenya or Morocco, as long as I come in with an understanding of what the country's history is, what their culture is, what the people are like, that is the first step in being able to build a good relationship with players. And then it's about understanding the league the teams and the players. Um, I never go in blind. I know all the members of my team. I know the competitions they've played in. I know the standard of the league. And so when they hear me speak from day one, like I know them, like I know the league, I know their country and I'm embracing their culture, that builds respect. And so it all comes down to preparation. I definitely don't go in um, blind at all. I, I do a lot of prep work before I land in country. I know the players before I've even gone in and, sh and shaken their hands. So that's why I'm always preaching preparation, preparation, preparation. Yeah, right. Um, I get, so what are your coaching aspirations moving forward over there? Are you staying over there? Are you going to come home where we could definitely use your expertise? You sound amazing and I would have loved you as a coach personally, but yes. Well, for me, uh, Africa is, Africa's time is coming. Uh, there's so much talent on the continent. There's so much investment happening in the sport. Look at the Basketball Africa League, for example, the NBA and FIBA joint competition that was launched in 2021. So for me, it's, it's a perfect time to continue coaching and helping to grow the game there. Um, yeah. But look, I would love to come back and coach in Australia again one day, uh, but I see that later down the line. There's so many talented coaches in Australia, but there is such limited opportunities. And I honestly feel that I wouldn't have had the same opportunities that I've had in Africa that I would have right. had back in Australia. That's just a fact, unfortunately. Like no one's tapping me on the shoulder and be like, come and work with the boomers. Yeah, right. You know, that's just the honest, that's the yeah. reality yeah. that we live in. And so for me, I don't see there being many opportunities for me to coach men's club teams or national the national team here. And so I might, might as well stay where I know that I've built a reputation, I've built great relationships, and I want to be part of the tidal wave of African talent coming through. Yeah. Look, I, if, you don't have people knocking on your door from the NBL, from anywhere in Australia. I think that would be very, very, very bad. Um, that would be very bad from basketball in Australia, um, from my perspective. I just think watching what you do, is it's incredible and how you're able to connect with those players. So that's just my two cents worth, of course. But... I appreciate that. I, I wish more people, honestly, in Australia felt that way. Um, I, I get a lot of love outside of Australia from 
women and men all around the world, but Australia is pretty, pretty, pretty quiet, unfortunately. But it's because well, I've not been part of the network. Yes. Years. I've been out, so. We'll start shouting your name, let me tell you. So that's why we're here. <laughs> So I guess, you know, on that, um, for, for other people wanting to follow your footsteps and go over there and be a part of something that's really exciting and special and like you said, the tidal wave that's happening over there, like what, how, how have those pathways changed since when you went over there? Is there an opportunity for people to get involved now? Like how? Well, most certainly. I think actually the most amazing thing this year was uh, coaching in the Basketball Africa League. Um, I was the first uh, female head coach, but there was a female assistant coach for the Senegalese club team. We had female commissioners, we had female referees, we had female females all through the operations side of the BAL. So it's there's so many different opportunities with the NBA coming in and launching this league. Uh, there's pathways for referees, officials, administrators, and coaches. It's about knocking on those doors. I'm always, one of the things I preach as women is we have to go and knock on doors. Yeah. Opportunities aren't going to come to us. And if there is an opportunity, go and create one. So for yeah. me, I've never been approached to coach a club. I always approach, I always approach them. My first national team outside of Zambia was with Cameroon. I flew to Tunisia and I approached the different coaches there, showing them the skills, the experience I had. And I said, I would love to join your team. And so we as women really need to be proactive. And there's, be that at the junior level, there's so many great academies um, and youth development um, leagues all across Africa, but you have to approach them. No one's gonna come and approach us. So that would be my advice in terms of women wanting to coach in Africa. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I get like you've sort of just touched on it, but I guess the challenges of starting on a new team, like you've done that a few times over there. What like what what does that sort of look like and, and what have they been for you? Oh, it's always it's always nerve wracking. Um, and be that, you know, in Africa or wherever you are in the world as a player, as a coach, it's always that nervousness that you get heading into that first first training session or first meeting. And for me, like I previously said, it's very much about preparation and making sure I know the country, the culture, the history, the people, as well as understanding my individual players, even if it's on a superficial level, it's like me knowing my most recent club, AS Sally, uh, I knew all the players, I coached against the Moroccan national team. So coming into that first session, I went straight up to each player by name and said, hi, I'm coach Liz Mills so great to meet you and I've been a fan or I've seen you play in whatever, Afro basket, etc. And so when they know that I have done my, my research, I've, I've automatically put my hand out in respect. Um, that builds a great relationship from the start. And then I think to put them at ease in that first training session, because they're nervous, I'm a new coach, but also I'm a woman. They've yeah. never had a female coach before. And so when they see me being very uh, dominant and authoritative, they fall into line very quickly. And they're like, oh, this is just like having a male coach. And so after that first, first session, they're just like, oh, okay, no worries. So do you feel like you have to be more sort of authoritative and yeah, like that, like, yeah, to get that respect and... Yeah, I definitely can't go in very soft and um, very like, hey, everybody, let's have a great session and, you know, kind of bubbly. I really have to be like, hi, I'm Coach Liz Mills. This is what we're doing in our session today. And OK, let's go. Um, there's definitely. The <laughs> yeah, pardon? Do you have them on the baseline? Like, do you get yeah, them uh, Yeah, like, you know, I have like, if you're not on the baseline and I put my hand up and I don't even call it out. So they have to be watching at all times what my hand is doing and they have to get to the baseline. If they don't, push-ups. Um, if So like, I don't like reinforcing with a negative consequence, but in those first couple of training sessions, I'm really on their ass from day one. And then once we build a relationship, I start easing back. But yeah. if I walked in and was very, um, almost too social and too friendly, they'd view that as me being soft. And that's, they don't want to see that. They want to yeah. see that I'm just like a male coach and 
Um, I'm not going to take any of their bullshit, basically. <laughs> and is that something that you've had to sort of learn over the years or is that something that's sort of natural for you? Or like, because for me, I feel like that's me naturally on a basketball court. I'm going to be out there and I'll tell you how it is. But um, so yes. how how was it for you? Yeah, I'm very naturally like that. Um, I kind of walk in and I'm like, I own this. So I'm going to tell you what to do. And if you're not going to be, you're not on the same page, you're not here to help this team win get out. I don't care who you are. So for me, um, I'm, I'm definitely no bullshit, no nonsense. Um, but on the flip side, I'm very like, I'm very friendly and social as soon as that whistle's uh, blown and the practice is done. And I think that's actually what shocks them the most is the emotional intelligence. They aren't used to a coach being like, how are you feeling? You know, or tell me about what's going on or like I remember I was coaching here and I was working with a high school team and they had this male head coach and one of the players came in and he clearly looked like something was wrong. Yes. And I was like, hey, what's wrong with him? And the head coach was like, what do you mean? Yeah. He was like, seriously? Like, and with African players in particular, you know, they're not as emotional as necessarily we would see in the West, even though Western men are very repressed as well, let's be honest. But for them, having a coach that's so um, in tune with their yeah. emotions, that's actually what they struggle to get to, de to, to deal with more than anything, any other part of my coaching style. Yeah, right. Oh, wow, you're amazing. Like just listening to you and your strength, it's, you know, for what you've been able to do, it's, I probably could talk to you for the next hour, to be honest. Um, that's cool. I, could, I could talk to you about everything with your career. I mean, how long do you have? So. Good while. Um, so I guess, you know, we've sort, again, we've touched on it through the conversation and everything, but just some really unique challenges that you've faced um, that your male counterparts haven't had to face, um, being, you know, a, a female coach of men's teams and everything. And look, I'm, I'm sure you've got a million stories, but um, just some things that you feel like you've had to face that you wouldn't have had to if you were a man. Well, first and foremost, the thing that really still upsets me to this day, even though I don't know why, because it happens all the time, is the assumption that I am the assistant coach. Yeah. And generally, I have male assistant coaches, though, you know, I'm planning to have an all female staff for my next coaching gig. So to compens to get rid of that as a problem, but generally speaking, um, officials will come up and speak to the male assistant coach and they'll disregard me. Or if I'm in a room with all the, you know, male head coaches, that all the discussion is around them. And I'm kind of the only woman sitting there being kind of ignored. Um, there's always a lot of discussion around my appearance and not just the trademark boots. You know, I'm often to, I get referred to as the pretty coach, like that even should matter. And then finally, I think, you know, there's so many that you could talk about, but generally speaking, presidents feel like they owe, that I owe them something for them giving me the opportunity to coach their teams. Right. And I'm pretty, yeah, and I'm pretty sure that men don't really get that either. Um, you know, for them, it's more transactional. I'm being paid to be here and that's the service I'm providing. Whereas yeah. some of the presidents that I've worked with, they're like, well, I gave you an opportunity that no one else would give you. So what are you giving me yeah i know and then that that inference as well it's just like you know i sometimes as an athlete too especially when i was playing over in russia and um spain like some of those countries china even that 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 got me like that you know we're paying you so what are you going to do for me like it, it was sort of like that and it just that feeling it got to the point for me in my career I was just like I can't deal with this I, that's why I went and started studying gender studies because I always felt like I owed people something and it was like no I actually deserve to be here um, and I deserve to be paid this money so yeah that's really interesting and then like being like you said just being the only woman in the room how how yeah. did you deal with that so when you're the only woman in those rooms with the coaches and they're talking through their stuff and completely ignoring you how, what do you do like to step in to have your voice heard? Oh, well, as you know, I'm definitely not a wallflower. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll put my hand up. I'll add my two cents. Um, I'll shine a spotlight on something. Um, I'm not shy about putting my hand up and being like, yo, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Or have you considered this? 
Um, have you considered how, you know, the female referees feel? So I'm always the person to put my hand up and wave the women flag. And so generally, that happened a lot more early in my coaching career in Africa. Now everybody's kind of just like, oh, it's just Liz, you know, standard issue. Um, it's more actually the foreign, the new foreign coaches, especially the ones from Serbia, I'm finding. <laughs> um, they're the hardest that I've had to deal with recently because I really feel that like Europe and speaking to some female head coaches that I know there, it's a really hard environment to crack and um, those Serbian coaches definitely don't um, embrace having women in the room, for sure. Yeah. Gosh, well, I mean, look, like I said, I really could sit here and talk to you all day, but um, this podcast only goes for 25 minutes or so. But I, um, I just want to say, look, thank you so much for um, having this chat. If there's any way that we can sort of amplify what you're doing and through the platform, even if we can follow your journey somehow, or if we could get you to blog or something, like, is there a possibility for you to do something like that? And well, I've actually, to be honest, I'm like I said, I'm really thinking of launching a like global female coaching network, and it's going to be. Um, a private group or a private like you register to join and so maybe promoting that eventually when I launch it for me I just haven't got my head around how I can best serve when I'm back in Australia how do I you know help women here because yeah. I just can't relate to what's going on here anymore like yeah. um, I'm so out of the loop I guess the fact that we're seeing what you're doing and the work that you're doing, like we want to promote it. And look, I know as another woman in basketball in this country, like it's women like you are going to really push it forward. So yeah, I'm happy to work with you on strategies around that and ways that we can really start making this better for you and for other women like you. Yeah. And yeah. I, like, I also, I really want to be part of the women's world cup here. Um, because, and obviously because Mali is coming and I want to yeah. really promote them participating. What happened with Nigeria is just crazy. But uh, yeah, so for me, I, even in a little way, because like I obviously don't coach in the women's program. Um, that's actually a question that I get asked all the time. Um, yeah. Do I want to coach in the WNBL or the WNBA? And that's the thing for, if I'm Greg Popovich, is anybody asking him if he wants to coach in the WNBA? Well, that's why I didn't really ask that question because I feel like what you're doing is so much bigger than that. Um, but, you know, in the same breath, not having you here in our country, like in our, whether it's male or female, whatever you're doing, um, it's a real letdown. Like we need to be able to find ways of keeping the best people in Australia in Australia. I think just talking like so openly about your experiences and like how you've gotten to where you get to. Like, I think it's just really encouraging hearing what you're doing, no one is doing here in this country. So people want to know about it and see it and, and hear how strong you are as well. Cause it's just, it's, it's really impressive. So. And I think for women in particular, um, we kind of feel like we're, you know, I coach in Sydney or North, whatever my club is, and this is my only opportunity, but you've got to, you've got to think outside the box and yeah. I can, get one coach and obviously I don't want to promote us all going to Africa or Asia or wherever <laughs> we've got to keep yep. the talent here as well um, but for me if I can inspire someone to you know just ask that question knock on that door so that they could get a coaching gig that's all that matters really yep. and like and to be honest after the Kenya stuff I had so many women around the world reach out and be like yep. we just didn't have a role model in fever to of what what you're doing and and to be honest lauren sometimes i feel like i'm fucking on an island like yeah. no one can relate to what yeah. what this feels like and you know obviously there's becky in the nba but the nba is such a like the NBA the world completely even the yeah. WNBA. and yeah. so because this is fever people can relate but there's like who who are my mentors? Who am I going to when Girl, you are the one. You're the trailblazer. <laughs> I'm like honestly, like Morocco was the worst coaching experience of my career, I'll be honest with you. And 
It was so, so difficult. And I said to myself, who the fuck am I going to talk to about this? You know? Yeah. So, but if I don't do it, who's going to be doing it? Yeah. So that's, and like, I want to be the first woman to coach at the Men's World Cup next year. Yeah. Could you imagine what that would do? That's amazing. You know, like. That's amazing. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to be an African team. Yeah. But so we're not going to go out and win it. But, yeah. you know, like that's why I, I was so disappointed when I didn't win the BAL title this year with Morocco yeah. because it would have been like, women can fucking win competitions, guys. Yeah. We can t- that's w- I was more disappointed about not being able to do that for women than actually yeah. losing the game because yeah. I, I this might be egotistical. I, I don't never really know, but I kind of feel like if I fail, I have failed women. Right. And so that's why, you know, we got knocked out in the quarters and I was like, oh my God, you know, even if we made the semis, then it's a good story about women and being successful. And so I'm just going to have to win the title next year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just like that. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. look, thank you so much just for your time and your openness and everything. And um, I'm going to just talk to some people here. Um, about some stuff but yeah look I think that there's plenty that we can do particularly on the platform to really promote you and your story and whatever else it is you you know we can do for you um, but yeah just really impressed and thank you you've been fantastic well thank you I hope hopefully next time when we meet I'm gonna like completely tell you about everything you've been through because I know I could learn a lot from you as from a player's perspective so definitely that's the next time all right, all right. well We'll be in touch. Thank you guys. All right. All right. Yeah. 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 Bye. Bye.